All right, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being on tonight. Um, if you don't know me yet, my name is Diane Dubois and I'm an organizer here at the Center for Biological Diversity. I have the great pleasure of being on the call tonight with Amaru Weiss, Colette Atkins, and Kiran Suckling. So let's go around and do some introductions. Um, do you wanna kick us off, Amaru? Sure. Hi, everybody. This is Amaru Weiss. I'm the Center's Senior West Coast Wolf Advocate. I'm a biologist and a former attorney. I've been doing this work for the last 23 years, and I've had the glory of working for the Center for Biological Diversity for the last eight of those. I cover wolf issues on the West Coast and at the federal front, and I'm very excited to be able to be here this evening with you and my colleagues. Welcome. I can go next. I'm Colette Adkins. I'm the center's carnivore conservation director. I work out of a home office in Minneapolis. I've worked at the center for about 10 years. I am uh, really love working on creatures like wolves and grizzlies and so glad to see so many of you joining us tonight. And I'm Kieran Suckling, the center's executive director, and I've been here for 31 years now since uh, since the very beginning of the center and I'm based in Tucson, Arizona and Portland, Oregon and I have the pleasure of working with all these amazing people on this uh, panel here today. Awesome thank you to all of you and Kieran I'll just pass it right back over to you if you want to kick us off tonight. Yeah so this panel um it's about wolves, uh, and that's super important. And we have a big announcement that I will not blow the cover of of wolf advancement today. Uh, but I'm here to talk to you so you don't have to hit the refresh button every three seconds to find out what's going on with the election and miss the wolf news. Um, so the election is um, super, super close. And um, we and I think probably all of you had had hoped it was going to be a landslide, and so more than a political victory, you know, a real repudiation of everything Trump, you know, what he's done to the environment and his racism and his misogyny and the whole kit and caboodle. And um, unfortunately, it's not it's not that, uh, which is really disappointing. Um, but at the same time, you know, what's happening now is what was predicted as plan B, which is if it's not a, a landslide, it's going to be close. And if it's going to be close, what's going to happen is uh, Trump's going to be up early in a lot of key states uh, because those early votes are in-person votes. And then that lead would start to decline. Um, as the mail-in votes started to get counted, which in most places are skewed toward the Democrats. And that's exactly what we're seeing now. So as um, nail-biting as it is, as nerve-wracking as it is, you know, it's good to remember that this is precisely the dynamic that was, that was predicted uh, by the pollsters. And we're watching it play out now. And so uh it still appears that that's happening um and biden is most likely um to be elected he's um up in um arizona and nevada very likely to win uh, we guess that those two that's enough he wins um but he's also pulling rapidly in uh, georgia and pennsylvania um, and is at this point likely to win Georgia and Pennsylvania, even though he doesn't doesn't need them. Uh, North Carolina, a little harder to predict. I, I think Trump's more likely to win to win there. But if we just hold on and uh, count all the votes, um, it, it's quite likely that um, Biden is going to win. Trump's filing lawsuits all over the place already. All, interestingly, Trump has filed suit to stop the counting in Michigan 
although Biden is ahead in Michigan. So it's really unclear what that Michigan strategy is. But regardless, he's filing a bunch of suits. Um, and from what I've seen so far, they're not really very worrisome. Uh, the states are all carrying out their um, electoral laws and policies, and the Supreme Court has very, very consistently deferred uh, to the states, even when the states are doing have bad laws and policies, still defers to them. So we're not really seeing any um, thing on the legal front uh, that makes us think that uh, Trump's lawsuits are gonna gonna come too much. Uh, but got to worry about them. Got to got to follow them. But uh, so far, I'm 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 hopeful. And I think everyone should stay hopeful and um, just push for counting all the votes. Uh, a lot of folks are in the streets right now about this issue, and that's um, certainly a reasonable position. We have not asked our folks to go in the streets yet, and that's because in in uh, all the outstanding states, they are counting the votes. We're not, we're not seeing the states try to uh, duck this responsibility. Um, and so our feeling is if, um, if we're out there too aggressively on this front, you know, we can, we can help create the impression that something wrong is going on, that there's something that needs protesting. But in fact, the states aren't doing anything wrong. They're, they're counting the votes. Um, if that starts to change, things go south, then we will be uh, asking people to go out and get on the streets um, and make sure this thing goes fair. So meanwhile, let's hear about wolves. That's a whole lot more interesting than being obsessed with Trump. Absolutely. I think Carla said it well in the chat that it feels good to be here doing something meaningful. Yeah. Wait for all of these results to come in. Um, Definitely. So thank you for that, Kiran. Um, so tonight, um, as we just mentioned, we're going to talk more about last week's wolf delisting. We'll talk about which populations are impacted and what this means for the future of wolves in the United States. We'll explain how the center is fighting back with our allies and what you can do to help and then we'll have plenty of times to answer your questions at the end of the call. So be sure to add those to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. All right, with that, let's go ahead and dive in. So this movement to save wolves has grown exponentially over the last couple of years. And that's thanks to the hard work of so many of you on the call tonight. Um, that being said, that means we have a lot of new people here. So I want to start us off with a question that may be helpful for some of those newer folks. Um, Amaruk, a species is supposed to be recovered to have its Endangered Species Act protections away. So when we talk about a delisting, it can be a little confusing. I know I've had conversations with people where they've said, that's great, <laughs> they're being delisted. That means they're doing well. And um, so can you kind of clear some of that up? Can you tell us the current status of wolves and what this decision actually means for them? You bet. So the fact that U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has decided to strip wolves of federal protections now does not mean that wolves are recovered. This is strictly a political decision that's been made. And this has been true every time in the past that U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has tried to prematurely delist wolves from the Endangered Species Act. Colette's going to describe shortly that this particular delisting rule is perhaps the most egregious attempt yet. And if you think about it, two key purposes of the Endangered Species Act are to protect imperiled species and the habitats on which they depend. But this delisting rule in it, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service ignores and misinterprets so much science. It ignores how much habitat is still available for wolves. And it ignores the fact that because wolves are so ecologically essential, that if you protect wolves, you are also protecting the habitats upon which they and so many other wildlife species depend. What does this mean? Well, when federal protections are removed from a species, 
management gets handed off to the states. And so states are now going to get to decide if wolves any, have any protections or none at all. States could decide to classify wolves as game mammals and allow wolf hunting. They could decide to classify wolves as fur bearers and allow trapping. Some states may decide to allow both. That's what happened in Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming when Congress delisted wolves in that region in 2011. And that's also what happened in Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin when the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was able to temporarily delist wolves in the Great Lakes region from 2012 through 2014. A state could even, as South Dakota already has, designate wolves as varmints who could be shot on site. Some states may not allow wolf hunting or trapping, at least not right away, but we assume that many states will. Thanks, Emmerich. So uh, we talked a lot last year with the Call of the Wild campaign about different populations of wolves around the country. Can you talk about which populations are impacted by this decision? Yeah, all the members of the gray wolf species across the lower 48, with the exception of the Mexican gray wolf down there in the Southwest, Arizona, New Mexico, with their exception, gray wolf populations in all of the states elsewhere in the lower 48 are going to lose federal protections. Wolves in the Northern Rockies, as I mentioned, lost protections in 2011. So this new rule affects wolves elsewhere in the country. So that means that wolves living in Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin, and wolves living in Washington, Oregon, and California are no longer going to have any federal protections. And if any wolves from those states disperse or try to disperse into adjacent states, that means they won't have any federal protections there either. And so from dispersals that we've seen from over the years, the states that are probably of most concern to us in terms of dispersing wolves are the Dakotas, Utah, Nevada, and all the way down to Colorado as well. And even though this rule does not strip protections for wolves in the Southwest, if the Mexican gray wolves that live down there were to disperse into the North, they could be at risk as well. And then lastly, this rule also means that any gray wolves that show up in the Northeastern United States, New York, New Hampshire, Maine, would have no protections. And given that just last week, a wild wolf was confirmed to be in Maine, a uh, new hope for wolves to establish there would be dashed by this rule. If they don't have the protections that are needed there to allow them uh, to reestablish and to prevent them from being killed. Absolutely. Yes, the news of the wolf in Maine was certainly a bright spot in my being from the Northeast. Um, so we know this isn't the first time we mentioned earlier that wolves have prematurely lost protection. So can you give some context about what has happened in the past when wolves have been delisted? Sure. In the past two decades, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has tried to strip wolves of protections multiple times, uh, up to nine times, I think. And they each actually first proposed to delist wolves all the way back in the early 2000s. But each time, conservation groups joined together to fight back. And those efforts involved multiple strategies that worked, and so we're going to be using them this time too. So first of all, each time a delisting rule was proposed, we got the public involved to submit comments. And I can tell you that over time, the army of wolf supporters has just exploded. The first time they tried to strip wolves of protections back in the early 2000s, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service received approximately 90,000 comments 95% of which were opposed to wolves being removed from the endangered species list. Now think about just last year, when they issued this new proposal in 2019, they got 1.8 million comments from people opposed to wolf delisting. So that's what we're talking about. If you've been on any of our webinars in the past, you know that we often talk about the phrase people power. A little bit later tonight, I'm gonna to talk about an example of some people power that really worked out great for wolves just this week, but I'm going to save that to the end. The power that you have all had in educating your family and friends and your colleagues and even people on the streets, for those of you that did tabling, to speak up for wolves, this really builds and it is, it's important. And why is it important? Because if Congress gets involved, and it happens all the time, 
that congressional electeds decide that they're going to get involved and try to pass some kind of wolf bill, which will always be a bad wolf bill. We need to be able to show members of Congress how much support there is across America for the Endangered Species Act and for wolves. And to be able to walk into their office and show them that 1.8 million people said, no, we want wolves protected and recovered in more places is really helpful. That really helps get bad federal wolf legislation stopped. So there's people power. Second, we always engage top scientists when a new delisting rule comes out to submit their own comments after they can review the proposed rule. And that's crucial for when we go to court because when we litigate, we need to be able to show that the US Fish and Wildlife Service is ignoring the best available science because the Endangered Species Act requires that they do that before they delist a species. Sometimes we're able to show because of what the scientists analysis has shown is that they're completely misinterpreting or misusing the science to justify what's clearly just a political decision. So a third key strategy we've used in the past and we're going to use in this case is litigation and Colette is going to explain this step in just a moment. And then a fourth strategy that we're going to use that we'll talk about later this evening is engaging you, the public, in a campaign to contact the governors of specific states where we think that wolves will be most at risk from delisting. Thank you. And that is a perfect segue into my next question. So Colette, can you talk specifically about what we're doing at the center this time to fight back against this delisting? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we've been expecting this. I mean, this proposed rule has been out for over a year now and we've been expecting it and we're absolutely ready. We've got, uh, we've assembled an amazing team of lawyers uh, at Earth Justice and I'll be working on the case too. Earth Justice is a nonprofit environmental law firm. They've got so much expertise because they've worked on all these previous rounds of woof delisting litigation as well. We've got a coalition of environmental groups, you know, it's the Center, Defenders of Wildlife, Sierra Club, Humane Society, Oregon Wild, and National Parks Conservation Association, and we're all teaming up together to challenge this uh, horrible decision in court. And the first step was taken today. We filed a notice of intent to sue the Fish and Wildlife Service over this delisting rule. That notice is a, re a step required by the Endangered Species Act. The idea is that you sh should give the agency the opportunity to correct their bad behavior before you go ahead and um, end up in court. We don't expect the Fish and Wildlife Service to, uh, you know, to pull the rule. We expect to be filing a lawsuit in 60 days. And that's just about when the, um, the final rule will become effective because there is a a 60 day wait between the publication of the final rule on November 3rd and when it becomes effective in January. But as soon as that notice period expires, we've got a final uh, rule that's effective, we'll, we'll bring that lawsuit in federal court. Thanks, Colette. I'm sure so many people on this call are ready to know that there is a plan in place to fight back. A few folks have anticipated this plan and have already reached out with questions and we always get this question. It's a little bit in the weeds, but I think it's really important uh, to address. So people have asked whether or not we'll be given an injunction. So can you talk about first what that means for folks on the call who may not know and then whether or not you think that will be possible in this case? Right, well, so an injunction, so, so one option would be to ask the court to enter a preliminary injunction. And what a preliminary injunction is, is that you're asking the court to maintain the status quo during, as the litigation proceeds, so that that harm doesn't take place in the meantime, because it can take, you know, a long time for the wheels of justice, you know, to proceed here. But the problem with that approach is that it requires that you, uh, prove several things that can be quite difficult. You need to show irreparable harm. And sometimes the courts require that you show that harm at the species level. So you need to show that, you know, in the time that it takes to litigate the case, that the species would be, you know, irreparably harmed. And then the other thing and the really, the, the key 
uh, strategic decision here is that you need to be able to show a likelihood of success on the merits at the very outset of the case before you've had a chance to look at all the, the documents underlying the agency's decision. And you need to put it forward in this truncated fashion in this brief uh, you know, motion for this in, uh, injunctive relief. And with a case like this, that's really quite complicated and really has these strong you know, technical arguments about the science and the definition of species, we're worried that we need to really, that we wouldn't be putting our best foot forward if we, had, if we presented all our arguments in that you know, concentrated fashion. So it's unlikely that we'll seek a preliminary injunction. We've had some preliminary discussions with our lawyers. They're not recommending it. I personally wouldn't recommend it. But what we're gonna do is make sure this case moves forward as quickly as possible so that um, hopefully we could get the delisting rule withdrawn before the start of next year's hunting seasons. But, you know, it's, it's frustrating, it's heartbreaking, you know, to think that there are wolves that are going to die um, while this case is pending. I'm just, I just wish the Fish and Wildlife Service wouldn't have done this again, uh, but they've done in this, they've done it and this is where we're at. That makes sense. I certainly share that sentiment. Um, so one more question. What are your thoughts on the lawsuit overall? Do you think there's a good chance for success here eventually? Yeah, I absolutely do think we'll win. You know, like Amaruk mentioned, I really believe this is the most damaging unlawful rule that we've seen yet. I mean, last time around, the Fish and Wildlife Service tried to remove protections from wolves just in those Great Lakes states. And the court set aside that rule as unlawful. And instead of going back, you know, proposing something more reasonable, maybe just a down listing, for example, um, the agency came back and expanded the delisting to cover all wolves across the whole lower 48, you know, with the exception of the Mexican wolves. They haven't fixed any of the problems that the court identified last time around. They're still uh, relying on progress towards recovery in just a couple areas, even though the vast historical range of the gray wolf uh, remains largely unoccupied. I mean, one of the things that I found just particularly just nonsensical in the delisting rule the Fish and Wildlife Service argues that they don't need to recover wolves in the Pacific Northwest, like in Oregon, Washington, or even California, because there's just too few wolves there. And I mean, I think a court's going to see right through that, that that just turns the Endangered Species Act upside down if they can use the fact that the species isn't recovered yet to argue that they shouldn't have to do any more recovery. It just doesn't make any sense. So I'm quite confident that the court is gonna set this uh, delisting rule aside, just like they've done with all, almost all of these uh, rules that we've seen previously. Um, so yeah, so part of me is kind of like, you know, bring it on. I know we're gonna get the result we need, but the other part of me is just so saddened to think of uh, all the damage that's gonna be done in the meantime. Absolutely. So um, on that, let's get to what you all can do to help kind of um, stop that damage. Uh, so that's how we're going to fight back in the courts. Um, and tonight, we are asking you to help us fight back on the state level. So the first thing we're going to ask you to do right away is sign our petition asking governors to protect wolves in their states. So you can click on the link right now in the chat box to sign that petition. Uh, after you sign it, and this is the most important part, so you'll receive a confirmation email from us and go in there and you'll see options to share the petition with your network. So you can email it or post on social media. Everything's pre-written for you. So it's super easy to just go in and share that with as many people as you can. And that's really important so that we can get the word out to governors. 
If you are on the phone, you won't get this link in the, you won't be able to see the chat box, but we'll send it out after the call as well. So you'll be able to see it there. That being said, uh, we know that many of you, all of you are probably feeling just as disheartened and frustrated as we are with this. Um, and signing a petition doesn't feel like enough. Um, if it weren't for this pandemic, we would certainly be out in the streets protesting. But the good news is there is still more that you can do while we're taking this fight to the courts. So um, Amr, can I pass it back over to you to just give a, clip, a quick glimpse of what people can do in their own states to protect wolves? For sure. It, Diane has prepared a superb toolkit for wolf activism that is geared specifically for this delisting rule. And what the toolkit will do is, is it lets you know which state should be targeted, who to contact in that state, how to contact them, and then we've also provided key talking points for you to use when you correspond with them. And the governors in the following states are the ones that really need to hear from the public. So as we mentioned before, Minnesota, Michigan, Wisconsin, the North Dakota, South Dakota, Utah, Washington, Oregon, but also Colorado and California. So you can use our toolkit to contact these governors to tell them directly that you oppose their state ever allowing wolf hunting or trapping or killing of wolves for livestock conflicts. And we're going to share that link in the, uh, to the toolkit in the chat box here as well. And that link is also going to be posted to our Slack site. If you use Slack and converse with us there, you'll be able to get it there as well. Awesome. Okay, so we're gonna move on to some questions. So feel free to, I know many of you have already um, post your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. There are, let's see, about 500 of you on the call right now. So we aren't gonna get to all of them, unfortunately, but we'll get to as many as we can. So bear with me for a minute here while I pull this up and sift through. Um, I guess the one question that I think is burning on everybody's minds, we got it before the call and we got it at the beginning of the call. Um, how could the results of the election impact wolves and could this decision be reversed? Um, all sorts of questions along those lines. Yeah, I can talk about that a little bit and maybe Kiran or Amaruk wanna chime in on this too. Um, because it does involve some speculation. I mean, but so let's assume for the, you know, our own mental health and for the sake of argument that Biden does uh, get elected. The fine, the rule will be final by the time he takes office. And um, at that point, there's not an easy way for it to be revoked. So especially, you know, so. Some people, you know, some long, long time wolf advocates might remember that when we had the transition to Obama, there was a delisting uh, rule in play that Obama held. And, um, and we we're all hopeful that he wasn't going to let it go through. But that was a situation where it hadn't yet become effective during that transition time. That's not going to happen here. But a Biden administration could, um, you know, order its the Fish and Wildlife Service to to relist wolves. Um, I don't know if that's likely or not. I mean, we do know that the uh, when it was Obama and Biden, they did put forward a delisting rule. But yeah, Kiran Amaruk, what do you think about that? Well, um, there's some possibility of that. I'm not. I'm not super hopeful on this. Um, yeah, I mean, it's important to remember that efforts to delist the wolf um, did not start with Trump. Uh, we saw these efforts under Obama. We saw them prior to that under Bush. And we even saw them first prior to that under, under Clinton. Um, and so the D.C.-based career fish and wildlife staff, so these are not like the political appointees. These are people who have been there 20 years, et cetera up to the highest ranks um, 
including Gary Frazier, the assistant director, who I know quite well and talk to a lot. They want to delist wolves. Um, in fact, they want to basically delist or refuse to list all large predators um, and just get the agency out of the business of recovering predators. Um, the most generous explanation is um, they feel like it's too expensive, and it is it's very expensive compared to most species. It's too controversial, and sure enough, yeah, it's controversial. Um, and they just, they've been beaten up so long over this, so long, um, that even those who are, you know, sort of generally sympathetic just don't have any fight left in them. So, um, so the bottom line of all that is if Biden comes in and he follows along and rebuilds a uh, Obama type Department of Interior environmental agenda, then he's not going to move uh, to help us out in this arena. Um, currently, his... Um, Pick his, I know his pick, that's too strong, but his uh, clear leader for Secretary of Interior um, is Senator Udall. And so whoever he picks as Secretary of Interior is going to be critical to making this decision. At the end of the day, probably Biden's not going to make this decision. It's going to be made by his Secretary of Interior. Udall is quite good. Uh, Udall is better than any of the people Obama put in office. Obama Secretary of Interiors ranged from from bad, uh, which was Salazar, uh, to um, to nothing burgers. Sally Jewell did absolutely nothing in that position. Um, Udall is good. He worked with Udall on a lot of issues. He's very knowledgeable, very interested. He comes from obviously the Udall family legacy and he'll feel that pressure. He'll feel Mo Udall's ghost um, and the family legacy looking over him as he makes decisions. So, so there's some chance that Udall could see the light on this. Udall's got a particular interest in um, Colorado and the Southern Rockies, which is the main issue for wolf recovery. So, um, so am I super hopeful Biden will help? Um, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know, but I do think uh, Biden, a uh, Udall, could possibly help, and he could, he could, and he could reverse this in the sense that Will Sue will be in court that provides an opportunity for the next administration to settle our lawsuit, withdraw that rule. That would be a reasonable position. Um, I'm trying to think, would I give it odds? Um, I, I think there's a good chance you'd all get in. That's probably 60, 70%. There's not, there's not gonna be any opposition to you'd all. Um, will you'd all do the right thing? Um, that's another 70%. So you put those together, you know, we're somewhere 30 to 50% chance. Next administration will turn this around. And I, I wish I could say that better. Uh, and related to that, one of the things that I think is going to be critical for the wolf, but for many other species is um, we've got to get rid of the old timers in the DC office of the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, even the best of them, uh, they've run out of steam, they're burned out, they're demoralized. Uh, they just don't have the energy to stand up for endangered species. Um, at this point, they're just in the way. Uh, and, I, and I hate to say that because I've known some of these people for 20 plus years, but that's, that's the reality of it. Um, and that's gonna help the wolf and many, many other species if, if we can just get these people out of office at this point and bring in new people. 
I think the information that Kiran just shared with everybody will give you some insights as to what the potential is. And because that is potential, in the meantime, we're going to be going with the things that we know have worked for wolves in the past since we don't know exactly what Biden's going to do. So we're going to court and we're asking you to make the states shape up their act and protect wolves in the meantime. And um, yeah, we're all in this together. Thank you. Related to that, actually, a couple of questions that are kind of similar. How can those of us not living in states where wolves currently live best support the effort to protect wolves at the state level? And someone else asked, do you want us to contact the governors in states where we don't live? Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to that. So yes, this wolf activism toolkit where we're asking people to write to the governors, that can absolutely come from everybody across the country. I mean, think about the fact that maybe you have family there. Maybe you have visited there. Maybe you have wanted to visit there. Maybe you're not going to go visit there again if they're not going to protect their wolves. So that's how I would frame your correspondence. You can take our talking points, which there's probably 12 different talking points there you can use when you write to them, but add in your own personal view on, you know, I've been to Minnesota before and I love it there, but I'm not coming back if you're going to allow wolf hunting and trapping there. You know, absolutely. The governors of these states need to also be reminded that it's not just that they have wolves within their own state boundaries. Wolves are a national treasure. They are a national part of our natural heritage. And wolves don't respect boundaries. I shouldn't even use the word respect. Wolves don't acknowledge boundaries. Those are people constructs, right? So wherever wolves can go, we're gonna follow with our battle cry. And we're gonna follow howling at all those governors and we want you to too. So yes, please, please. And when you, you know, when you get this information from the toolkit or even when you sign the petition, please share that information on your own social media and email it out to your friends. This is like the letter writing campaign last year. We need to get on 1.8 million people again writing all these governors. So yeah, please go for it. Absolutely. Um, and someone was also asking, why is it strategic to talk to governors and are they going to care about this? Well, I can give you one example from Minnesota and then Amaru can fill in some other details. You know, that's where I live. And it's been so awful to see when federal protections were removed, how many wolves have been hunted and trapped. And But we've got a Democratic governor here now, um, Governor Waltz, who has spoken out against wolf hunting and trapping. And in fact, the Minnesota DNR submitted comments on uh, opposing the nationwide delisting of wolves. So things can change and uh, things can change in response to pressure from the people. So uh, definitely like Walt, for example, in Minnesota, he needs to know that the people are behind him or he's not going to stick his neck out and challenge his own, um, you know, Department of Natural Resources to do the right thing this time. Yeah, and I'll give some examples from the West Coast as well. So when the delisting rule came out in 2019, we had people writing the governors then. You, you might remember this if you were part of our campaign back then. And in Oregon, the State Wildlife Agency wrote to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and urged them to delist wolves. And when the governor of Oregon found that out, she was just outraged. And she issued a public statement lambasting her own state agency and saying, no, that is not the position of the state of Oregon. We don't think wolves should be federally delisted. In Washington, Governor Jay Inslee was a little more cautious about that. He eventually came out saying, we don't think that wolves should be delisted in places where they don't have good scientific management plans. Uh, but he eventually did come around more to a strong statement that, that um, Wolves shouldn't be federally delisted in Washington. And think about this, he just got reelected and this will be his last term. He has nothing to lose right now. And he is an environmental governor. Like he's the only governor that's come out so strongly on issues like climate change. So uh, yes, please hit up Governor Inslee and remind him 
that you don't want anything to happen to wolves in his state in the way of hunting or trapping or expanded livestock uh, conflict, killing of wolves. Uh, in California, we ended up having a statement coming out of our own State Fish and Wildlife Commission to US Fish and Wildlife Service saying, no, we don't want you to federally delist wolves. So your voice at the state levels actually translated into statements and letters and public actions uh, by the state leadership. And sticking to the West Coast for a minute, um, someone is asking here, what is the status of California wolves? Are they protected under the State Endangered Species Act? California wolves are protected under the State Endangered Species Act here, and that's because the center and three allies filed a listing petition with the state back in 2012, right after OR7 came across the border. And so they are protected under California's State Endangered Species Act, which is one of the most uh, protective State Endangered Species Act in the country. California's act uh, would not allow, does not allow wolves to be killed now, for instance, for livestock conflicts, because there's so few wolves in the state. The state ESA doesn't allow killing of listed species unless there's a way to completely mitigate their loss. And with only 14 wolves in the state, there's nothing you could do to mitigate the loss of any wolves if you killed them. I do think that it's still important to contact California governor and officials because what may happen now with the loss of federal protections is that there may be a movement by the livestock industry to try to pressure the state to amend the State Endangered Species Act to allow for killing of wolves at these low numbers. And you know, one of the other things that happens with the loss of federal protections here is the state loses federal funding. So the federal funds that were provided for the wolf biologist here, those will disappear with the loss of federal protections. The funds that were provided by the federal government for assistance to implement non-lethal conflict deterrence measures, uh, that will also disappear. And then one of the other difficulties is that as long as wolves are federally listed anywhere, if a wolf was illegally killed, and this isn't just in, in California, anywhere else it would apply, the feds would have had the ability to, uh, if they decided to, to uh, prosecute someone for illegal killing a wolf. But under state laws, the statute of limitations as to how long you have before you have to find the person to prosecute them are much shorter. Like in California, we only have a one year statute of limitations. So the ability to prosecute poachers also disappears. So it's important even in places like California to remind the governor that we have a fragile tiny wolf population here and that we need to keep the state protections as strong as possible. Thank you. All right, taking it from California all the way over to the East Coast where I am in North Carolina, several folks asking if this impacts the red wolves at all. No, it doesn't. Red wolves are still protected under the Endangered Species Act. Although, you know, there's a whole nother story there about the Fish and Wildlife Service mismanaging that species. Something that we've worked really hard on. And in fact, just a uh, this fall, we got a, a victory on that one where the Fish and Wildlife Service now needs to rewrite the Red Wolf's recovery plan. Um, so it's really been unambitious in its protection of Red Wolves and it uh, hasn't pursued recovery in other parts of its range. You know, they're only found now in North Carolina, but they were once found all across the Southeast. So there's a lot to be done on Red Wolves and we're trying to push the Fish and Wildlife Service in the right direction. but at least they do have their federal protections. All right. uh, let's see here. How long does it generally take for a state to publish rules once federal protections are removed? And um, they also said they can't just declare open season on wolves the next day, can they? Do you wanna to speak to that? Colette, because you're in a state that has had wolf hunting and trapping instituted and then stopped with the court overturning it? Yeah, you know, it really depends on state to, you know, state to state how quickly they can basically get, 
get all everything together to start a hunting season. So, um, so even like in Minnesota where there's, you know, the statute would allow a hunting, they need to, um, you know, set the quota, they need to set up the permitting system and, you know, to give the licenses. And there's a little bit of uh, lag time there. I think states that have never had a hunting season, it would take, uh, take longer. And in fact, sometimes it would require some action by the legislature to, to get there. But that's a hard one to answer in, in general, because it really do, does depend state to state. All right, we'll do a few more questions here. Um, we've, we have several questions about um, wolf management in Colorado and wondering if wolves can legally be killed there today. So I was actually going to save this um, information till towards the end, but I'll, I'll announce some good news right now here as part of this answer. If you have been following the election results, and I can't imagine anybody on this webinar hasn't been following election results, you may already know that Proposition 114 passed in Colorado. And this is an, a fantastic example of people power campaign. Proposition 114, because it passed, now requires the state wildlife agency there to develop a wolf conservation recovery and reintroduction program to actually reintroduce wolves to Colorado. And that reintroduction has to start by December 31st of 2023, I believe. So um, they're gonna have uh, a lot of great work to do in front of them for the next couple of years. And that, that's incredibly exciting. And th this was a, a campaign that, um, you know, survey, you know, again, what do was what does one take away from polls? You know, the, the information we've gotten from polls coming out in May is that 84% of the public supported having wolves reintroduced to the state. But this actually came down by a hairline. I believe the final vote count was only 20,000 people more in favor than opposed. And that's because the folks that were opposed to wolves came out with a blithering, just uh, whirlwind campaign, anti-wolf stuff in the media, but people power prevailed. And so uh, now we are going to have the opportunity to have wolves in Colorado. I actually do not know whether or not wolves are listed under the State Endangered Species Act in Colorado. And I, I'm seeing Kiran and, and Colette nod their heads. So I think the answer to that is probably yes. Uh, otherwise they wouldn't even have been able to put that proposition on the ballot. What, what I don't know is if their state ESA is as protective as California's is. So, um, you know, for instance, in Washington, even though wolves are listed under the state ESA there, uh, the state agency is still allowed to kill wolves for livestock conflicts, but they can't just open up a hunting or trapping season. So similarly in Colorado, they wouldn't just be able to open up a hunting and trapping season now that they've approved reintroducing wolves there. Um, but I don't know whether or not the state ESA allows wolves to be killed for livestock conflicts. I don't know if Colette or Kiran know the answer to that. My understanding is that they they contemplate the possibility of uh, killing wolves for livestock conflicts, but they don't actually have a full fledged plan there. That's part of what we'll see, um, you know, coming from this process. So there'll be more uh, opportunities for folks to engage and make sure that we have a protective plan coming through in Colorado. But oh my gosh, we just need to celebrate. The center put in so many resources, so many of you called and emailed and yeah, it's a it's a tremendous news. I mean, when you think of all the vast wild places that we have in Colorado, it was a real tra tragedy to not have this amazing predator there. I'm just so thankful that, you know, we're gonna be able to right this, this wrong that we did by eradicating wolves there. For sure. And I know we have several folks, I'm sure, on the call tonight. Um, Tara, Deborah, Rhonda, so many people that played such an essential role in that campaign. So thank you to all of you for all of your work and for giving us a reason to be very helpful despite last week's news on wolves. Um, let's see. 
A few more questions about um, specific populations. So folks are asking about the Mexican gray wolf in the Southwest and how this impacts them. So if you've been following the Mexican gray wolf saga, uh, it's a program that's had a lot of political challenges right from the start. And the population was starting to build up a bit more in the last few years, but then in just this last year or two, we've seen a whole nother spate of illegal wolf killings and very aggressive agency wolf killings for livestock conflicts. Uh, the center has been involved in a lot of litigation against the program down there and has had some recent victories that are going to require US Fish and Wildlife Service to kind of go back to the drawing board and, and rewrite their wolf recovery program. Um, however, with this delisting, you know, one of the things that's been troubling is that uh, the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service recovery program so far has really limited wolves to just this small geographic area in Arizona and New Mexico. And if wolves from that region travel further north because wolves do disperse where they feel like they need to go, uh, if they wander into some of the other states, where protections have been completely lifted, they could be in danger there. They could be shot uh, by people who don't know that they're Mexican gray wolves or do know that they're Mexican gray wolves, but claim that they didn't realize that that's what kind of wolf it was. So there, there is definitely still some danger to that population based on this delisting rule. Thank you. All right, so I think we better move on here from questions. I know um, there are so many good questions in here and I wish we could talk about wolves all night. Um, but unfortunately we can't, but we do have tomorrow at noon Pacific, three Eastern, we'll have a live Q&A session on Slack with Amaruk and that will be in the Wolf Campaign channel. So. If you are not already on Slack with us, um, we are sharing the link to join us there in the chat box now. And this will also be in the follow-up email if you're on the phone. If you have trouble getting into Slack or need some help figuring it out, you can always email us at mobilize at biologicaldiversity.org and we will get back to you there. Um, and with that, I will pass it back to Amaruk to close us out. Thanks, Diane. So all of you already know, I think, that wolf activism is really an expression of our deepest selves. It's, it's a, a pure expression of our profound connection to the wild. And that connection multiplied by thousands and millions of voices leads to changes in policies and laws and in culture and reintroduction of wolves in Colorado. Wow. Um, this fight for gray wolves, it's not a sprint. It is a marathon. And you can count on us here at the center to be in this for the long haul. And we feel like it is such a privilege to be working with all of you on this because we know that you're going to be in it for the long haul as well. Thank you so much from every one of us at the center. Thank you, everyone. And I see a couple of questions. If you missed part of this or joined late, we will send out a recording. Um, so don't worry about that. Thank you all for joining and we will talk soon.